Good morning once again to everyone. Parang tulog pa rin. Good morning po. Yeah, may energy na tayo. So it's a beautiful morning. But today, you know what? It's not me who's gonna share God's word today. We have a very special guest with us. And I'm very much excited to introduce him to you. But before, before that, I would just like to put on a personal note. Na-meet ko po itong tao na to last February while we were meeting for the Send the Lights project. So yun po yung ating condominium. So once again, sino pong excited for our condominium? Ayan, so marami pong excited. Sige po, palakpakan po natin si Lord for that. So isa po siya doon. He's one of our uh, meeting mates nung time na yun. We met here sa Marriott Manila. And I could tell that he's a man of wisdom when I was talking to him. I'm really encouraged with his words, with his insights, with his ideas also for for this church. And you know what? Uh, our special guest is the Asia Pacific Field Director. So he's under him are almost 10,000 churches. So not just 10,000 members, not just 10,000 people, but 10,000 churches who's holding so many uh, thousands and thousands of people. So without further ado, I would like to invite here on stage Bishop Andrew Binda. Sige nga po, binagyan natin siya ng COG Marriott. Welcome. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord and good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord here with you at Metro uh, Marriott Manila. God bless you. Uh, I'm so excited to be here, uh, but not because of the past and everything that has been accomplished, but really and truly, I'm excited for today and for the future, what God will do here amongst you. We really, really want to celebrate the leadership of Pastor AJ. Put your hands together for him this Wonderful uh, man of God that the Lord is raising up. And uh, aren't you happy that he's leading this church? Amen. And God is using him mightily in these last days. We're excited to partner with uh, uh, the Marriott Manila Church of God or Church of God Marriott Manila um, with the City of Light Project. We are uh, happy that when we um, prayed and we was seeking uh, direction for uh, these cities, the cities of the world, that uh, we chose Manila. And uh, when we were looking for an open door, not wanting to reinvent the wheel, we learned of the great move of God that is happening right here. And uh, it was a no-brainer. We decided that we're going to come and we're going to partner with you. And so, amen, the churches of God in the United States and Canada, they're raising funds for us to, amen, to acquire the property that we've seen, that we've already uh, located, and God is going to bring that to fruition, amen? So pray for the church of God, pray for the church of God world missions, pray for the national leadership who are also partnering with us and blessing Amen, this local congregation. And we just know that God will do a mighty work amongst us. Amen. So if you have your Bibles today, just turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse number 18. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Reading from the New International Version. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. On this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. Today, I've chosen to speak on the subject matter, the church that Jesus is building. Perhaps you have heard of a church that is being built in Barcelona, Spain. That church has been under construction for 130 years. Construction began in the year 18. 82, and it is expected to be completed in the year 20, 
26. Back in history, when the cornerstone was laid for this church, uh, Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria was the monarch of England. For all that time, this local church, Sangrada Familia, or the sacred family in English, had been wrapped in scaffolding and in cranes, and the work has literally inched along, except for an interruption during the Spanish Civil War in the year 1936. In the year 2010, the interior of that church was completed, and in November of that year, the reigning Pope, Pope Benedict dedicated or consecrated the church in front of a congregation of 6,500 people. They say an additional 50,000 people gathered outside of the building where there were uh, 1,000 or 100 bishops and 300 priests to administer the Holy Communion upon its completion. Sangrada Familia will have 18 towers with the highest being 560 feet tall. The designer, the famous Antoni Gaudi, who designed this church, he designed it so that it will not be taller than a, the, a famous mountain in Barcelona because it was his conviction, being a devoted Roman Catholic, that the highest point in any city should not be a God or a man-made structure, but something made by God himself. You can even say that Gaudi gave his life for this church project. For one day on his way to the work site, he was crossing the street and he was struck by a streetcar and he died. You heard me right this morning. This church, Sangrada Familia, had been in under construction for now some 130 years. Now. When you understand the church, you understand that Jesus has been building his church for over 2,000 years. In this very familiar passage of scripture that we read, we understand that Jesus is hanging out with his disciples in a place called Caesarea Philippi, and he decided to have a little Q&A with them, a pop quiz. How many of you like pop quizzes in school? Now when your teacher just decided to give you a little quiz, I never like those. I like to study. I like to be prepared for an exam or something, you know. He's the smartest guy in this classroom anyways. But back to our story, and Jesus asked a very simple question. Whom do men say I am? And several answers surfaced. Some said that you are Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. And, and then Jesus, being a little bit more direct, asked uh, a very pointed question, he said, but whom do you say the Son of Man am? And it was Peter who said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus made a very powerful declaration. He said that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Now, right there in that divine moment of truth, in that great moment of revelation, Jesus declared that I will build my church. Now, you and I that are here at the Marriott Manila uh, Church of God, you understand that you are a part of something that Jesus is building. Are you with me? Every time you come here realizing that Jesus, you're a part of something that Jesus died for, the church. The Bible says that he loves the church and he gave himself for it. So every time you give of your offerings, every time you give of your talent, every time you give of your time, you are saying or you are being or, or taking part in something that Jesus himself is building. 
have you ever stopped to consider it? Had Jesus been on earth today, what would he be doing? A lot of things, right? Healing the sick, raising the dead, stuff that he had already done. But I guarantee you, he will also be about building his church. Amen. Now, if Jesus was building his church, what would that church look like is the next question. Or, In other words, what would be in that church's DNA? What kind of church would Jesus want to build? What would Jesus like that church to look like? Amen. And I guarantee you today that from my studies and from what the Lord has revealed to me, that he will be building a church, first of all, that is Christ-centered in theology that is called Christocentric. Secondly, I believe that Jesus desires to build an other-minded church. And thirdly and finally, I believe that it is his desire to build a missions-focused church. A missions-focused church. That's the three-point outline of our message today. Amen. We'll look at the first one, and that is he desires to build a Christ-centered church. We all know that Jesus established the church way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were created and God gave them dominion over His creation. Everything that He had created, and we know that Adam and Eve, they, they did what? They messed up. Simply put, they messed up. That's not something that is... Uh, uh, uncommon to us. We know what it is to mess up, right? Amen. But listen, God will come to Adam and Eve in the garden and God will provide a covering for them. Amen. So that Adam and Eve could still enjoy the presence of the Lord despite of their sin. Aren't you glad that the Lord did not just condemn them, but that the Lord covered them? Can you say amen? And that's the way it is with the Lord God. When we sin, when we make a mistake, when we falter and we fail, that the Lord does not condemn us, amen, that the Lord comes and He covers us. Because when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, His blood, amen, provides that covering and that atonement for sin. This is the good news of the kingdom of God. This is the good news of being, hallelujah, a born-again believer that God does not leave us in our state of sinful devastation, but He calls us to turn from our sins, to repent of our sins, amen, and to look to Him for hope and for restoration. Can you say praise the Lord? And each of us, we need that. Hallelujah. When you go back into the Old Testament, you know that there's synonyms for the word church in the Old Testament. This word temple and the word tabernacle. You remember when Jesus, when God, uh, amen, um, uh, uh, instructed, instructed Moses to build a tabernacle? In the wilderness, a place where the people will come and they will worship God. Amen. You remember the instructions in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Now down there you notice that it had uh, several pieces of equipment in there. The Ark of the Covenant and the altar of incense in the temple of God. But guess what I want to, uh, well, listen what I want to communicate with you. It was a place where they experienced the presence of God. So although they were in a desert, amen, they could still, hallelujah, experience the presence of God in the midst of the people so that they realized that although they were in the desert or they were in the wilderness, that God had not forsaken them, but that God was still with them. 
And so in life, you and I will go through what is called these desert experiences. A dry and a dusty place. A place, amen, where there seems like there is no life. Hallelujah. But look, amen. You don't have to look too far to find God. God is still with you. Are you with me today? That's the amazing thing about God. That God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But He promised to be with us even unto the end. Amen story continues about how the church was built in the Old Testament and there was this great uh, beautiful edifices that King Herod built. David was the chief architect of that building. David was not allowed to build a temple because David was a warrior. David had blood on his hands. And God said, no, 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 no. You're not going to build a temple. But Samuel built the temple. But guess what? David was the chief architect of that temple. And David was the chief fundraiser of that temple. Which tells me that, amen, you may not be the pastor. You may not be the worship leader, the keyboard player. Amen. But whatever role you play in the church, it is important. Amen. And God will send news to Nathan, the true Nathan, the prophet, after this was Nathan who told David, you know, you're not, gonna, you're not allowed to build a temple. You're, you're, you're a warrior. You have blood on your hands. But God, after David will build the funds to, ra- to build a temple or raise the funds to build a temple, God sent back Nathan to David and says, your desire to build a temple is a good and noble thing in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, how Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm happy to be here today. Not because I'm the one preaching, but because I know this is God's church. And I know God wants to build His church. And I know I have a part in building God's church. And so when you're dancing up here, when you lift your hands to God, when you're greeting people at the door, hallelujah, when you're packaging the food for fellowship afterwards, you're being, you're, you're participating in what Jesus himself is doing. We are building God's church. Oh, give him praise and give him glory today. Hallelujah. It's a good and noble thing when you give your tithes. Amen. When you bring your offerings, oh, hallelujah, and you give it, you prepare it, ah, hallelujah, as an as, 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 as as act of worship, as an act of worship, and you give it willingly to the Lord, and it goes to the storehouse of the Lord to help build the temple of God. God will say to you, he sees it, he understands your situation, and he loves you for it. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You, Jesus. He's building the church. He's building the church. Just recently, we were, you know, we observed the Holy Communion, uh, the, uh, the, the Easter season, and observed Holy Communion, and we, we, every time we observe Holy Communion, we realize that we are remembering ah, the work of the cross. We're remembering what the Lord has done for us. Amen. And so, when Jesus died, remember one day when he went to the temple and he saw these guys, they were doing some things that weren't right in the temple. They were, you know, they made it a den of thieves according to the word of God. And, and Jesus got a rope and he just whipped them and chased them out of that temple. And amen. The Lord was not pleased with what they were doing in the temple. And then Jesus promised that told them, made a great declaration, and he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up, raise it up again. And right away we realized, people were looking at him, are you kidding? These great big columns, this big temple that took years and years to construct, what is he talking about? Well, Jesus wasn't talking about a physical temple. He was talking about himself. Amen? And so he was showing us there, there was a transition. Transition from the Uh, all the way, as I've said already, in the book of Genesis, amen, in the Garden of Eden, into the involvement with the tabernacle, and then the great uh, beautiful sanctuary that was built, and now the great temple of Herod. And now Jesus says something different about that temple, that it, it is a spiritual house. It is just not the church. It's just not a temple built with hands. It's not the great building over at Das Marinas. Amen? Or the big Catholic church that's down the road over here. So that anywhere you go, you realize that you are the temple of God. And that God dwells in you by His Spirit. 
Oh, hallelujah. And so when you're at school, amen, you can minister to people. Are you getting me? You don't have to wait for a priest to pray. You don't have to wait for a, 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 a man, a pastor to lead the worship wherever you are because you're the temple of God. You take the presence of God with you. Hallelujah. Imagine. Imagine. If you had to wait until you get to church to call unto God when you're sick, you'll probably die. Amen. But wherever you are, hallelujah, you can call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. So wherever you go, you take the name of Jesus with you. Hallelujah. The church that he's building is not something naturally. Of course, when we talk about the church, we're talking about a building as well. But we're also, you have to understand, it's just not a building. And also, people are so worried about beautifying that building. But what the Lord is more interested in is that we beautify our hearts. Hallelujah. That we live in a place where we are His, His, amen, His children. And He's just love. Hallelujah. And we give Him worship. Sweet aroma. Oh, glory be to God. Do you not realize in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 that you are the temple of the body? The, realize that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have received from God. So you see, the church was established by Christ, but that Jesus also leads the church. Now listen very carefully. We're talking about the church must be Christocentric, Christ-centered. The next step in the construction of Gaudi's church, and he's built several, several churches in Europe. Amen. And I, I've been to that church a, a, a few couple of years ago, a couple, two years ago in, in uh, July. We took what is called a Mediterranean cruise, took our family on this beautiful cruise in Europe, and, and uh, we stopped off in Barcelona. And my son, although he's not a Barcelona fan, he's a real Madrid fan, by the way, so don't. Don't hold him anything against him for that. But he's 15, Nathaniel. You'll get to meet him one day. He wanted to see the stadium, the soccer stadium, and stopped off in Barcelona, and we went. And I wanted to see Sangrada Familia. And we went. It's a beautiful church. You can check it out online. Not now, afterwards, okay? You can check it out, amen? And beautiful church, conical, and some parts of it, just the way it's constructed, you would literally think you're walking through a forest in the church. Beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. The facade as you enter the building, it's still in co under construction. One day when you go to Spain, go and see it, all right? I pray that every one of you will get to see the church, but you can certainly read up about it. But the next phase in the construction of this church is the completion of its final tower. Guess what the tower is called? The Tower of Jesus. Guess how tall the Tower of Jesus will be? 550 feet. Guess which is the tallest tower? The Tower of Jesus. Oh. Could it be that this man, Antonio Gaudi, this great, amen, designer and architect knew something else that he was trying to communicate to the world could it be that he was trying to remind all of us when we see that church this is the tower of jesus it's the tallest of them all hallelujah maybe he was trying to say to us that it's about jesus folks Oh, glory be to God. Maybe he was trying to say that everything we do in the church has to be about Jesus. So lift him up higher and higher. Lift him up so that the world can see. The Tower of Jesus, 550 feet tall. And on top of it, there will be a cross, making it the tallest tower. Hallelujah. And so when you come, to this place of worship, this house of worship. We must lift Jesus higher and higher. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Listen, when you're singing those songs, just don't sing it. Just don't mouth it. Just don't, uh, amen, just, just don't, don't recite it. Hallelujah. Make melody in your hearts. Offer worship to Him. Let it come from the depths of your heart. But when you begin to 
do that, then you're participating in worship. Otherwise, all you're doing is singing another song. Oh, ah, but when you worship Him, you must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that's the way you lift Him up. Hallelujah. And the entire world will know. That your God is alive, not only in this church, but your God is alive in this temple right here. Can you give him another praise? Amen. It's about Jesus. That's a hard thing for this culture, for your generation, especially you young people, because in this generation, it glorifies me-ism. Everything about me. Well, I mean, some people have gone as far as calling us or you the selfie generation. Amen. I've experienced in the Philippines, you guys love to take pictures. Amen. And that's all right with me. It's a generation that glorifies self. I was talking to my daughter. She's 26 years old, and she was at an Indian Hindu wedding five days all week long. <laughs> and she says the mother of, the, of her friend wants her to leave or wants her to stay when she wants to leave. Mother saying, I had one daughter, she's already gone. Now, please stay with me. She, in other words, she loves Kristen like her own daughter. So I, I replied on my text, and I said to her, Kristen, you have to realize, sometimes, and I really put most times I meant, we don't do what we do is not for us. We do for others. Just stay as long as you can and be by her side. Amen. We don't live for ourselves. We live for others. That leads me to the next point of my message. The church that Jesus is building is other-minded. You look in the New Testament, there's over 50 references to the term one another or each other. That's why when the rich young ruler came to Jesus or when the disciples or they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, well, really, he coupled two of them together. All the laws and the precepts from the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments and what else. Really, it's hinged on two. What is it? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And hold on. And thy neighbor, not just thy neighbor, as thyself. Boy, that's tough. Are you kidding me? That's the gospel. Hallelujah. That we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. Not a percentage. Hello. Not a piece. Hello. Not a part. But with all of our heart. Not 50%. Not 90%. Not once for an hour and a half a week, but with all, with all. Are you with me? Imagine if you had a girlfriend and she asked you, do you love me? And you say, yeah, I do. Well, how much do you love me? Well, you know, you got a piece of my heart. Well, who's got the other piece? Well, you know, my first girlfriend. I'm not, you, I tell you what. You'll probably get a slap in your face. I'm talking to the boys because I am a man, okay? You'll probably get a slap in your face or somebody would literally walk out on you because they want all of you. Amen. And in the same manner, the Lord is not, there's nothing selfish about that. Love is selfless. Hallelujah. Amen. And your love for God. That's why the first two commandments, thou shalt love the Lord your God. Hallelujah. And thou shalt have no other images before you. Has to do with that love. But you go back to this great commandment. And the great commandment said, And thy neighbor as thyself. You love God. This is the great commandment. Here, listen to this. Love God and love yourself. That's, a, that's what it boils down to. Love for God and love for one another. Are you following me? If you have that in place, then all the problems in this world would be eradicated. Check it out. If you love God and if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to cheat on your wife, those of us who are married. 
You're not going to lie. You're not going to steal. There's not going to be any terrorism around. Are you following me? No. We won't need martial law. Sorry. I don't need to get into your politics. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Because we love God. And when we love God, we love people. Hallelujah. And when we love people, we're not going to hurt people. The problem is we're not good at the Great Commission. Amen. We got one part. Okay, I love you, Lord, with all my heart, and I lift my hands to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. We love that part. But when it comes down to loving our neighbor as ourselves, hallelujah. So we've got, as a church, we've got to get better at the great commandment. Say amen, somebody. We've got to get better at the great commandment when we come to God. When in our times of prayer, God help me to love my neighbor. God help me to love my friend. God help me to love my classmate. God help me to love the world because he loves the world and he gave himself for it. The church that Jesus is building is other minded. We must prefer one another. We must give our hearts and give ourselves one to the other. But thirdly and finally, the church that Jesus is building is also mission focus. Mission focus. Make no mistake about it. The purpose of the church is to exalt Christ. We've done an excellent job. The worshipers. I was watching the ladies and the young men that danced. They were sweating. Amen. It's good. It's good work. Amen. Sweat for Jesus. Burn some calories for Jesus. That's not for some of you. That's for some of me. <laughs> Amen. I, I took a picture this, this time on this mission trip. I was in Bangladesh. I said, I can't post that. My God, I put on weight. Since people, people must think you can't raise money looking that good. I said, I'm not suffering. You got to suffer for the Lord. You know, they want to see bulging eyes and ribs protruding said no but what I was trying to say is that I began to look too good I put on some weight I didn't want my family to see that the mission of the church is to exalt Christ that's why we worship amen the mission of the church is to equip the saints that's why they had a conference amen up north it's to equip the saints and that's why there's classes for you but thirdly and finally Make no mistake about it. The mission of the church is to evangelize sinners. Now check this out. If one of the purposes of the church is because it is other, the church that he's building is other-minded, then it means that whatever we do, we've got to go after sinners. It's not about us. The church is the only organization on the earth that is not for us. Check this out. The church is for us, but it's not for us. Who's the church for? sinners the church is for others that's why jesus came he came for you you every one of you every christian every believer but check this out he also came for 4.5 billion people in this world who does not follow him 7.5 billion or 7 billion in the world 7 billion people in the world 2 0.5 billion know Jesus Christ. That's even counting Catholics, by the way. Hello. Every brand and stripe. But the other 2.5 billion, that's us. That's us, right? But the other 4.5 billion doesn't know him. He came for them as well. And so the mission of the church, hallelujah, is to go after those that are not saved. So when you leave this place, you now become a witness for the Lord. And this is what the Lord has called us to. We are called to the mission of the church. And the mission of the church is to see all sinners come to repentance. That's why he's not willing that any should perish. That's why God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. And we ought not to be selfish about our salvation. We ought to take it to the world, the ends of the world. I'll close with this story. There was a touring group from 
Iowa that was visiting London, England. And during that time, they went and they visited the Westminster Abbey. You've seen it when they, the babies are dead, British, the royal babies are being dedicated, Westminster Abbey. During that time, they, they marched through that church and they showed these people all these beautiful paintings and the different sections of the church. And it was, people were just admiring everything. At the end of the tour, the tour guide asked this question. Are there any questions? Simple question. Good tour guide. Are there any questions? Does anyone have a question? There was a lady in that tour group that had, was sitting in a wheelchair. She had been in a wheelchair, rolled around throughout that tour. She didn't say much, but on that day, she muscled every ounce of energy. And she inched up and got as tall as she can. She lifted up her hand and she says, I've got a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And this is our question. Has anyone been saved here lately? Beautiful church. Kings and queens have been coronated here. The babies, hallelujah, they've had their commissioning, their, their, their uh, confirmation here. Priests have been commissioned here. But has anyone been saved here lately? Beautiful worship is happening. We're having a big congregation. Good things are happening. Hallelujah. Church of God, Marriott, Manila. But has anyone been saved here lately? Would you stand with me? The church that Jesus is building, Christ-centered, other-minded, mission-focused, heads bowed and eyes closed as they begin to sing, Jesus, you're the center of it all. Hallelujah. 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 I'll invite you as I invite Pastor AJ to come as well. Hallelujah. Amen. Center, Lord. If you have a need in your life that relates to the message, or perhaps you have any other need, physical, spiritual, financial, whatever it may be, hallelujah. Just come to the altar today and we'll pray with you. We'll pray with you. Pastor AJ, hallelujah. Just come. Let's just worship. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ. This is a challenge for us today. It's about being selfless today. It's not about us. It's not about the material things of this world. It's not investing in this world, on this earth. Why? Because everything we invest here is temporary. But where is God leading us? God is really leading us into an eternal investment an investment in heaven where there is forever. And that's where God wants you to be. And how will that happen? It's just letting God be the center of it all. Be the center of your life. It's not about you anymore. It's not about me anymore. It's not all about the eyes of this life. It's all about Jesus. When people see us, it's not about me. It's not AJ. It's Jesus. When people look at this church, it's not about the church of God, it's Jesus. Because Jesus is the center of our lives. Jesus is the center of this church. And Jesus is the center of this nation. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Lord God. Lord God, thank you for this wonderful time, Lord Jesus. Just move, continually move in this place. And if it's, that's your desire today, telling God, Lord, I want to be selfless. Lord God, enough of me. I'm tired of me. I'm tired of everything. It's all about me. Could you raise up your hands today, especially those who are in, in, in this altar today. If you're saying that, Lord, enough of me. This time, it's about you. 
and join me in this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ here, I am here I am in front of you. In front of you. I humble myself, I humble myself before, you, Jesus. before you, Jesus. Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty. It's, enough of me. it's enough of me. I'm tired, Lord God, of all about being myself. Self-centeredness, Lord. It drives me nowhere. I want you, Jesus, to be the driver of my life. I want you, Jesus, to be the center of my life. Enough of loving myself. Enough of loving myself. But Lord God, I want to love you first. I want to love you. I want to give all my love to you. I want to give all my all my heart. All my heart. All my soul, all my soul, all my strength, all my strength, and with that love, and with that love, I could love others. I would love. Others. I could love my family. I could love my family. I could love my friends. I could love my friends. I could love the city. I could love. I could city. love my church. I could love my church. I could love my nation. I could love my nation. All for greater glory. Hallelujah. Just give God our very best clap offering. Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Before we end, let us raise up our tithes and offering to the Lord. It's our act of worship to Him. Telling God, our life is not about money. Our life is not about wealth. Our life is not about our finances. Our life is all about Jesus. Amen? It's all about Jesus. Money is not the center of our life. Jesus is the center of it all. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus Christ. Could I just invite everybody to stand up and let's raise up our tithes and offering. Lord God Almighty, Lord God, thank you, Lord God, for this wealth, Lord God. Thank you for our finances, Lord God. Thank you for blessing us, Lord God. And Lord God, we don't want, Lord God, money, Lord God, to be the center, Lord God. That's why, Lord God, here we are, Lord God, raising our uh, blessings to you, Lord God. We raise it up, Lord God, because we're telling you, Lord God, you are the center of our lives. And no matter where we are right now, how the status of our finances are, how the status of our work or our businesses are, Lord God, it's still all about you. Lord God, our hearts will still give to you, Lord God, because you are the center of it all, Lord God. And here is our wealth, Lord God. Here is our tithes and offering. We give it all back to you. And Lord God, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this wonderful service, Lord God. Thank you for your beautiful word, Lord God. It's a preparation for us, Lord God, to go all the way once again for you. Lord God, you are building this church, Lord God. You are its constructor. Lord God, you are its engineer. Lord God, you are its architect, Lord God. You're going to design this church beautifully. And Lord God, it's you, Lord God, who will be the center of it all, Lord God. You are in our hearts, Lord God. Lord God, bless us, Lord God, this temple, Lord God. Our hearts, Lord God, dwell in our midst, Lord God. Holy Spirit, we just invite you, Lord God, to move, Lord God. We want to make things happen, Lord God, all for your greater glory. We want to go all the way for you, Lord God. We want to save more souls for you. Not just our lives, Lord God, but more souls, Lord God. The lost souls, Lord God. The broken hearts, Lord God. The broken homes, Lord God. The wounded, Lord God. They are the people we want to save, Lord God. Empower this church, Lord God. This church is all about you. And Lord God, bless us, Lord God, for this wonderful time. Lord God, bless us for the rest of this day. Lord God, thank you, Lord God, for the life of Bishop Andrew Binda, Lord God, for using him mightily. Lord God, bless him more and more abundantly, Lord God, in the mission that you have for his life and for his family. Lord God, thank you for this beautiful day. We give you back all the glory and all the praise in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless everybody. Go in peace and have a blessed weekend.